This is Invaders by John Kessel. And try to keep track of the dates because this story goes back and forth in time. Just make it easier. Invaders. 15 November, 1532. That night, no one slept. On the hills outside Cajamarca, the campfires of the Inca's army shone like so many stars in the sky. De Soto said Atahualpa had perhaps 40,000 troops under arms. Looking at the myriad lights spread across those hills, Candia realized that estimate was, if anything, low. Against them, Pizarro could throw 100 foot soldiers, 60 horses, and eight muskets. Pizarro, his brother Hernando, De Soto, and Benalzacar laid out plans for an ambush. De Candia and his artillery would be hidden in the building along one side of the square, the cavalry and infantry along the others. De Candia watched Pizarro prowl through the camp that night, checking the men's armor, joking with them, reminding them of the treasure they would have, and the women. The men laughed nervously and wetted their swords. They might sharpen them until their hands fell off. When morning dawned, they would be slaughtered. De Candia breathed deeply of the thin air and turned from the wall. Ruiz de Arca, an infantryman with a face like a clenched fist, hailed him as he passed. Are those guns of yours ready for some work tomorrow? We need prayers more than guns. I'm not afraid of these brownies, de Arca said. Then you're a half-wit. Soto says they have no swords. The man was probably just trying to reassure himself, but de Candia couldn't abide it. Will you shut your stinking fool's trap? They don't need swords. They only spit all at once will be drowned. Pizarro overheard him. He stormed over, grabbed De Candia's arm, and shook him. Have they ever seen a horse, Candia? Have they ever felt steel? When you fired the harker bus on the seashore, didn't the town chief pour beer down its barrel as if it were a thirsty god? Pull up your balls and show me you're a man. His face was inches away. Mark me. Tomorrow, St. James sits on your shoulder, and we win a victory that will cover us in glory for 500 years. December 2, 2001. Defense! Defense! The crowd screamed. During the two-minute warning, Norwood Delacroix limped over to the Redskins', Redskins special conditioning coach. My knee's about gone, said Delacroix, an outside linebacker, <coughs> linebacker with eyebrows that ran together and all the musculature that modern pharmacology could load onto his six-foot-five frame. I need something. You need the power of prayer, my friend. Stoner's eating your lunch. Just do it. The coach selected a pop gun from his rack, pressed the muzzle against Delacroix's knee, and pulled the trigger. A flood of well-being rushed up Delacroix's leg. He flexed it tentatively. Felt better than the other one now. Delacroix jogged back onto the field. Defense, the fans roared. The overcast sky began to spit frozen rain. The ref blew the whistle, and the Bills broke huddle. Delacroix looked across at Stoner, the Bills' tight end. The air throbbed with electricity. The quarterback called the signals. The ball was snapped. Stoner surged forward. As Delacroix backpedaled furiously, sudden sunlight flooded the field. His ears buzzed. Stoner jerked left and went right, twisting Delacroix around like a cork in a bottle. His knee popped. Stoner had two steps on him. TD for sure. Delacroix pulled his head down and charged after him. But instead of continuing downfield, Stoner slowed. He looked straight up into the air. Delacroix hit him at the knees and they both went down. He caught him. The crowd screamed louder, a scream edged with hysteria. Then Delacroix realized the buzzing wasn't just in his ears. Elation fading, he lifted his head and looked toward the sidelines. The coaches and players were running for the tunnels. The crowd boiled toward the exits. Shredded thermoses and beer cups and radios. The sunlight was harshly bright. Delacroix looked up. A huge disc hovered no more than 50 feet above, pinning them in its spotlight. Stoner untangled himself from Delacroix, stumbled to his feet, and ran off the field. Holy Jesus and the Virgin Mary on toast, Delacroix thought. He scrambled toward the end zone. The stadium was emptying fast, except for the ones who were getting trampled. The throbbing in the air increased in volume, lowered in pitch, and the flying saucers settled onto the NFL logo on the 40-yard line. The sound stopped as abruptly as if it had been sucked into a sponge. Out of the corner of his eye, Delacroix saw an NBC cameraman come up next to him, focusing on the ship. The side divided and a ramp extended itself to the ground. The cameraman fell back a few steps, but Delacroix held his ground. The inside glowed with the bluish light of a UV lamp. A shape moved there, lurched forward to the top of the ramp. A large, man-like thing, it advanced with a rolling stagger like a college freshman at a beer blast. It wore a body-tight red stretch suit, white circle on its chest with a lightning bolt through it, 
some sort of flexible mask over its face. Blonde hair covered its head in a kind of brush cut. Two cup-shaped ears poked comically out of the sides of its head. The creature stepped off onto the field, nudging aside the football that lay there. Delacroix, who majored in public relations at Michigan State, went forward to greet it. This could be the beginning of an entirely new career. His knee felt great. He extended his hand. Welcome, he said. I greet you in the name of humanity and the United States of America. Cocaine, the alien said. We need cocaine today. I sit at my desk writing a science fiction story, a tall, thin man wearing jeans, a white t-shirt with the abstract face of a man printed on it, white high-top basketball shoes, and gold-plated wire-rimmed glasses. In the morning, I drink coffee to get me up for the day. At night, I have a gin and tonic to help me relax. November 16, 1532. What are they waiting for? What are, what are they waiting for, the shitting dogs? The man next to Diarca said. They're trying to make us suffer. Shut up, will you? Diarca shifted his armor. Wedged into the stone building on the side of the square, sweating. Been waiting since dawn in silence for the most part, except for the creak of leather. Uneasy jingle of cascabels on the horse's trappings. The men stank worse than the restless horses. Some had pissed themselves. A common foot soldier like Diarca was lucky to get a space near enough to the door to see out. As noon came and went with still no signs of Atahualpa and his retinue, the mood of the men went from impatience to near panic. Then late in the day, word came that the Indians were moving toward the town again. An hour later, 6,000 brilliantly costumed attendants entered the plaza. They were unarmed. Atahualpa, borne on a golden litter by eight men in cloaks of green feathers that glistened like emeralds in the sunset, rose above them. Diarca heard a slight rattling, looked down, found that his hand, gripping the sword so tightly the knuckles stood out white, was shaking uncontrollably. He unknotted his fist from the hilt, rubbed the cramped, cramped fingers, and crossed himself. Quiet now, my brave ones, Pizarro said. Father Valverde and Filippio strode out to the center of the plaza right through the sea of attendants. The priest had guts. He stopped before the litter of the Inca, short and steady as a fence post. Greetings, my lord, in the name of Pope Clement Seven. His Majesty the Emperor Charles V, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Atahualpa spoke and Filipino translated, Where is this new God? Valverde held up the crucifix. Our God died on the cross many years ago and rose again to heaven. He appointed the Pope as his viceroy on earth. The Pope has commanded King Charles to subdue the peoples of the world and convert them to the true faith. The King sent us here to command your obedience and to teach you and your people in this faith. By what authority does this Pope give away lands that aren't his? Valverde held up the Bible. By the authority of the word of God. The Inca took the Bible. When Valverde reached out to help him get the cover unclasped, Atahualpa cuffed his arm away. He opened the book and leafed through the pages. After a moment, he threw it to the ground. I hear no words, he said. Valverde snatched up the book and stalked back toward Pizarro's hiding place. What are you waiting for, he shouted. The saints of the Blessed Virgin, the bleeding wounds of Christ himself, cry vengeance. Attack and I'll absolve you. Pizarro had already stridden into the plaza. He waved his handkerchief. Santiago, and at them. The lines of Indians jerked like startled cats. Bells jingling, DeSoto's and Hernando's cavalry burst from the lines of doorways on the adjoining side. Diaco clutched his sword and rushed out with the others from the third side. He felt the power of God in his arm. Santiago! He roared at the top of his lungs and hacked halfway through the neck of his first Indian. Bright blood spurted. He put his boot to the brown man's shoulder and yanked free, lunged for the belly of another wearing a kilt of bright red and white checks. The man turned and the sword caught between his ribs. The hilt was almost twisted from Diaki's grasp as the Indian went down. He pulled free, shrugged another man off his back, and daggered him in the side. After the first flush of glory, it turned to filthy, hard work. An hours wade through an ocean of butchery in the twilight. Bodies heaped waist-high, boots skidding on the bloody stones. Diaka alone must have killed 40. Only after they had slaughtered them all and captured the Sapa Inca did it end. Silence settled, broken only by the moans of dying Indians and distant shouts of the cavalry chasing the ones who had managed to break through the plaza wall to escape. St. James had indeed sat on their shoulders. 6,000 dead Indians, not one Spaniard nicked. It was a pure demonstration of the power of prayer. January 31, 2002.
It was Colonel Zip's third session interrogating the alien. So far, the thing had kept a consistent story, but not a credible one. The only thing that kept Zip from panic at the thought of how his career would suffer if this continued was the rumor that his fellow case officers weren't doing any better with any of the others. That and the fact that the Krell possessed technology that would reestablish American superiority for another 200 years. He took a drag on his cigarette, first of his third pack of the day. Your name? Zip asked. You may call me Flash. Zip studied the red Union suit, the lightning bolt, the flat chest, the rounded shoulders, pointed upper lip, and pronounced underbite. The alien looked like a cross between Wally Cleaver and the Mock Turtle. Is this some kind of joke? What is a joke? Never mind. Zip consulted his notes. Where are you from? God has seated us an empire extending over 16 solar systems in the Orion arm of the galaxy, including the systems around the stars you know as Tau Ceti, Epsilon Eridani, Alpha Centauri, and the red dwarf Barnard Star. God gave you an empire? Yes. We were hoping he'd give us your world, but all he kept talking about was your cocaine. The alien's translating device had to be malfunctioning. You're telling me that God sent you for cocaine? No, he just told us about it. We collect chemical compounds for their aesthetic interest. These alkaloids do not exist on our world. Like the music you humans value so highly, they combine familiar elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, in pleasing new ways. The colonel leaned back, exhaled a cloud of smoke. You consider cocaine like, like a symphony? Yes, understand, colonel. No material commodity alone could justify the difficulties of interstellar travel. We come here for aesthetic reasons. You seem to know what cocaine is already. Why don't you just synthesize it yourself? If you valued a unique work of aboriginal art, would you be satisfied with a mass-produced duplicate manufactured in your hometown? Of course not. We are prepared to pay you well in a coin you can use. If we don't need any coins, if you want cocaine, tell us how your ships work. That is one of the coins we had in mind. Our ships operate according to a principle of basic physics. Certain fundamental physical reactions are subject to the belief system of the beings promoting them. If I believe that X is true, X is more probably true than if I did not believe so. The colonel leaned forward again. We know that already. We call it the observer effect. Our great physicist, Werner Heisenberg, yes, I'm afraid we carry this principle a little further than that. What do you mean? Flash smirked. I mean that our ships move through interstellar space by the power of prayer. May 13, 1533. Atahualpa offered to fill a room 22 feet long and 17 feet wide with gold up to a line as high as a man could reach if the Spaniards would let him go. They were skeptical. How long would this take? Bizarro asked. Two months, Atahualpa said. Bizarro allowed the word to be sent out, and over the next several months, bearers chewing the coca leaf in order to negotiate the mountain roads under such burdens brought in tons of gold artifacts. They brought plates and vessels, life-size statues of men and women, gold lobsters and spiders and alpacas, intricately fashioned ears of May, every of maize, every kernel reproduced with leaves of gold and tassels of spun silver. Martin Bueno was one of the advanced scouts sent with the Indians to Cusco, the capital of the empire. They found it to be the legendary city of gold. The Incas, having no money, valued precious metals only as ornament. In Cusco, the very walls of the sun temple, Coracancha, were plated with gold. Adjoining the temple was a ritual garden where gold maize plants supported gold butterflies, gold bees, pollinated gold flowers. Enough loot that you'll shit in a different gold pot every day for the rest of your life. Bueno told his friend Diego upon his return to Cajamarca. They ripped the plating off the temple walls and had it carried to Cajamarca. There they melted it down into ingots. The huge influx of gold into Europe was to cause an economic catastrophe. In Peru, at the height of the conquest, a pair of shoes cost $850, a bottle of wine $1,700. When the old horseshoes wore out, iron being unavailable, the cavalry shod their horses with silver. April 21, 2003. In the executive washroom of Bellingham, Winston, and McNeese, Jason Prescott snorted a couple of lines and was ready for the afternoon. He returned to the brokerage to find the place in a whispering uproar. In his office sat one of the Krell. Prescott's secretary was about to piss himself. It asked specifically for you, he said. 
What would Attila the Hun do in this situation? Prescott thought. He went into the office. Jason Prescott, he said. What can I do for you, Mr. The alien's bloodshot eyes surveyed him. Flash, I wish to make an investment. Investments are our business. Rumors had flown around the New York Merc for a month that the Krell were interested in investing. It earned vast sums selling information to various computer, environmental, and biotech firms. Several of the aliens had come to observe trading in the currencies pit last week. Only yesterday, Jason had heard from a reliable source they were considering opening an account with Merrill Lynch. What brings you to our brokerage? Not the brokerage. You. We heard that you are the most ruthless currencies trader in the city. We worship efficiency. You are efficient. Right. Maybe there was a hallucinogen in the toot. I'll call in some of our foreign exchange experts. We can work up an investment plan for your consideration in a week. We already have an investment plan. We are, as you say, in the markets, long in dollars. We want you to sell dollars and buy francs for us. The franc is pretty strong now. It's likely to hold for the next six months. So we'd suggest you wish to buy $50 billion worth of francs. Prescott stared. That's not a very good investment. Flash said nothing. The silence grew uncomfortable. I suppose if we stretch it out over a few months and hit the exchanges in Hong Kong and London at the same time, we want these francs bought in the next week. The week after that, a second 50 billion, 50 billion a week until we tell you to stop. Hallucinogens for sure. But that doesn't make any sense. We can take our business elsewhere. Prescott thought about it. He would take every trick he knew, and he'd have to invent some new ones to carry this off. The dollar was going to drop through the floor, or the franc would punch through the sell stops of every trader on ten world markets. The exchanges would scream bloody murder. The repercussions would auger holes in every economy north of Antarctica. Governments would intervene. It would make the historic Hunt Silver Squeeze look like a game of Monopoly. Besides, it made no sense. Not only was it criminally irresponsible, it was stupid. Crow would squander every dime they'd earned. Then he thought about the commission on $50 billion a week. Prescott looked across at the alien. From the right point of view, Flash looked like a barrel-chested college undergraduate from Special Effects U. He felt an urge to giggle, a euphoric feeling of power. When do we start? May 19, 1533. In the fields, the Purix, singing praise to Atahualpa, son of the sun, harvested the maize. At night, they celebrated by getting drunk on chicha. It was, they said, the most festive month of the year. Pedro Sancho did his drinking in the dark of the treasure room, in the smoke of the smelter's fire. For months, he had been troubled by nightmares of the heaped bodies lying in the plaza. He tried to ignore the abuse of the Indian women, the brutality toward the men. He worked hard. As Pizarro's, as Pizarro's squire... It was his job to record daily the tally of Atahualpa's ransom. When he ran low on ink, he taught the Purix to make it for him from soot and the juice of berries. They learned readily. Atahualpa heard about the ink and one day came to him. What are you doing with those marks? He said, pointing to the scribe's tally book. I'm writing the list of gold objects to be melted down. What is this writing? Sancho was bewildered. Over the months of Atahualpa's captivity, Sancho had become impressed by the sophistication of the Incas. Yet, they were also queerly backward. They had no money. It was not beyond belief that they should not know how to read and write. By means of these marks, I can record the words that people speak. That's writing. Later, other men can look at these marks and see what was said. That's reading. Then, this is a kind of kipu. Atahualpa's servants had demonstrated for Sancho the kipu a system of knotted strings by which the Incas kept tallies. Show me how it works, Atahualpa said. Sancho wrote on the page, God have mercy on us. He pointed. This, my lord, is a representation of the word God. Atahualpa looked skept skeptical. Mark it here. He held out his hand, thumbnail extended. Sancho wrote God on the Incas' thumbnail. Say nothing now. Atahualpa advanced to one of the guards, held out his thumbnail. What does this mean? he asked. God, the man replied. Sancho could tell the Inca was impressed, but he barely showed it. That the Sapa Inca was, had maintained such dignity throughout his captivity tore at Sancho's heart. This writing is truly a magical accomplishment, Atahualpa told him. You must teach my amatos this art. Later, when the Viceroy Estere, Father Valverde, and Pizarro came to chide him for the slow pace of the gold shipments, Atahualpa tested each of them separately. 
Estrada and Valverde each said the word God. Atahualpa held his thumbnail out to the conquistador. Estrada chuckled. For the first time in his experience, Sancho saw Pizarro flush. He turned away. I don't waste my time on the games of children, Pizarro said. Atahualpa stared at him. But your common soldiers have this art. Well, I don't. Why not? I was a swineherd. Swineherds don't need to read. You're not a swineherd now. Pizarro glared at the Inca. I don't need to read in order to, in order to, I don't need to read to order you put to death. He marched out of the room. After the others had left, Sancho told Atahualpa, you ought not to humiliate the governor in front of his men. He humiliates himself, Atahualpa said. There is no skill in which a leader ought to let himself stand behind his followers. Today, this, the part of the story about the Incas is, a, is as historically accurate as I could make it. The Krell business is science fiction. I even stole the name Krell from a 1950s SF flicks. I've been addicted to SF for years. In the evening, my wife and I washed the bad taste of the news out of our mouths by watching old movies. A scientist asked why he read SF, replied, because in science fiction, the experiment always works. Things in SF stories work out more neatly than in reality. Nothing is impossible. Spaceships move faster than light. Atomic weapons are neutralized. Disease is, ab is abolished. People travel in time. Why, Isaac Asimov even wrote a story once that ended with the reversal of entropy. The descendants of the Incas, living in grinding poverty, find the most lucrative crop in coca, which they refine into cocaine and sell in vast quantities to North Americans. August 23, 2008. <clears throat> Catalog number 208, said John, John Bostick. Georges Seurat, bathers. French government falls, the Morning Times had announced. Japan bans U.S. imports. Food riots in Madrid. But Bostick had barely glanced at the newspaper over his coffee. It was buzzed on caffeine and adrenaline, and it was too late to stop the auction, the biggest day of his career. The lot list would make an art historian faint. Guarnica, the potato eaters, the scream, Miro, Rembrandt, Vermeer, Gauguin, Matisse, Magritte, Pollock, Mondrian, six desperate governments that had contributed to the sale, and rumor had it that the crowd would be among the bidders. The rumor proved true. In the front row, beside the solicitor, Patrick McClanahan, sat one of the unlikely aliens wearing red tights and a lightning bolt insignia, the famous Flash. The preacher sat there lazily, while McClanahan did the bidding with a discreet raised forefinger. But bidding on the Surratt started at a million and went orbital. Soon became clear that the main bidders were Flash and the U.S. government. The American campaign against cultural imperialism was getting a lot of press. Ironic, since the Yanks could afford to challenge the Krell only because of the technology the Krell had lavished on them. The probability suppressor that prevented the detonation of atomic weapons. The autodidactic antivirus that cured most diseases. There was talk of an immortality drug, of a time machine. So what if the European community was in a six-month economic crisis that threatened to dissolve the unifying efforts of the past 20 years? So what if crowd meddling destroyed humans' capacity to run the world? The Americans were making money. The crowd were richer than Croesus. The bidding reached $1.2 at which point the American ambassador gave up. Bostick tapped his gavel. Sold, he said in his most cultured voice, nodding toward the alien. The crowd murmured. The Americans stood. If you can't see what they're doing to us, then you don't deserve our help. For a minute, Bostick thought the auction was going to turn into a riot. Then the new owner of the pointless masterpiece stood, smiled, ingenuous, clumsy. We know that there has been considerable disquiet over our purchase of these historic works of art, Flash said. Let me promise you, they will be displayed where all humans, not just those who can afford to visit the great museums, can see them. The crowd's murmur turned into applause. Bostick put down his gavel and joined in. The American ambassador and his aides stalked out. Thank God, Bostick thought. The attendants brought out the next item. Catalog number 209, Bostick said. Leonardo da Vinci, Mona Lisa. July 26, 1533. The soldiers, seeing the heaps of gold grow, became anxious. They consumed stores of coca meant for the Inca messengers. They fought over women. They grumbled over the heirs of Atahualpa. Who does he think he is? Governor, governor, 
treats him like a Hidego. Father Valverde cursed Pizarro's, Pizarro's inaction. That morning, after prayers, he spoke with Estetti. The governor has agreed to meet and decide what to do, Estetti said. It's about time. What about Soto? De Soto was against harming Atahualpa. He maintained that since the Inca had paid the ransom, he should be set free, no matter what danger this would present. Pizarro had stalled. Last week, he had sent De Soto away to check out rumors that the Tawansuyans were massing for an attack to free the Saka Inca. A steady smiled. Soto's not back yet. They went to the building Pizarro had claimed as his and found the others already gathered. The Incas had no tables or proper chairs, so the Spaniards were forced to sit in a circle on mats as the Indians did. Pizarro, only a few years short of three score, sat on a low stool of the sort that Atahualpa used when he held court. His left leg, whose old battle wound still pained him at times, was stretched out before him. His loose white shirt had been cleaned by some Purik's wife. Valverde sat beside him. Gathered were Estede, Benalzacar, Almegro, De Candia, uh, Pizarro's young cousin Pedro, the scribe Pedro Sancho, Valverde, and the governor himself. As Valverde and Estede had agreed, the viceroy went first. The men are jumpy, governor, Estede said. The longer we stay cooped up here, the longer we give these savages the chance to plot against us. We should wait until Soto returns, De Candia said, already looking guilty as a dog. We've got nothing but rumors so far. I won't kill a man on a rumor. Silence. Trust De Candia to speak aloud what they were all thinking but were not ready to say. The man had no political judgment, but maybe it was just as well to face it directly. Verde seized the opportunity. Atahualpa plots against us even as we speak, he told Pizarro. As governor, you are responsible for our safety. Any court would convict him of treason and execute him. He's a king, De Candia said. Face flushed, he spat out a cut of leaves. We don't have authority to try him. We should ship him back to Spain and let the emperor decide what to do. This is not a king, Valverde said. It isn't even a man. It is a creature that worships the demons. We have spells about half wits like Candia. You saw him discard the Bible. Even after my months of teaching, after the extraordinary mercies we've shown him, he doesn't acknowledge the primacy of Christ. He cares only for his wives and his pagan gods. But he's satanically clever. Don't think we can let him go. If we do, the day will come, he'll have our hearts for dinner. We could take him with us to Cusco, Benalzacar said. We don't know the country. His presence would guarantee our safe conduct. We'll be traveling over rough terrain, carrying tons of gold with not enough horses, Alamegro said. If we take him with us, we'll be ripe for ambush at every pass. They won't attack if we have him. He could escape. We can't trust the rebel Indians to stay loyal to us. If they turn to our side, they can just as easily turn back to his. And remember, he escaped before during the Civil War, Valverde said. Whose car, his brother, lived to regret that. If Alawapo didn't hesitate to murder his own brother, do you think he'll stop for us? He's given us his word, Candia said. What good is the word of a pagan? Pizarro, silent until now, spoke. He has no reason to think the word of a Christian much better. Valverde felt his blood rise. Pizarro knew as well as any of them what was necessary. What was he waiting for? He keeps a hundred wives. He betrayed his brother. He worships the sun. The priest grabbed Pizarro's hand, held it up between them so they could both see the scar there, where Pizarro had gotten cut, preventing one of his own men from killing Atahualpa. He isn't worth an ounce of the blood you spilled to save him. He's proven worth 24 tons of gold. Pizarro's eyes were hard and calm. There is no alternative, Valverde insisted. He serves the Antichrist. God demands his death. At last, Pizarro seemed to have gotten what he wanted. He smiled. Far be it from me to ignore the command of God, he said, since God forces us to it. Let's discuss how he wants it done. October 5, 2009. What a lovely country Chile is from the air. We should be proud of it. I'm from Los Angeles, Leon Sepulveda said. As soon as we close this deal, I'm going back. The mountains are impressive. Nothing but earthquake and slag. You can have Chile. Is it for sale? Sepulveda stared at the Krell. I was just kidding. They sat at midnight in the arbor, away from the main buildings of Iguazo Microelectronics of Santiago. The night was cold and the arbor was overgrown and the bench needed a paint job. Then a lot of things have been getting neglected in the past couple of years. 
all the more reason to put yourself in a financial situation where you didn't have to worry. Well, Sepulveda had to admit that since the, ad the advent of the Krell, such positions were harder to come by, less secure once you had them. Flash's earnestness aroused a kind of horror in him. It had something to do with Sepulveda's suspicion that this thing next to him was as superior to him as he was to a guinea pig, plus the alien's aura of drunken adolescence, plus his own willingness, despite the feeling that the situation was out of control, to make a deal with it. He took another Valium and tried to calm down. What assurance do I have that this time travel method will work? It will work. If you don't like it in Chile or back in Los Angeles, you can use it to go into the past. Sepulveda swallowed. Okay. You need to read and sign these papers. We don't read. You don't read Spanish? How about English? We don't read at all. We used to, but we gave it up. Once you start reading, it gets out of control. You tell yourself you're just going to stick to nonfiction, but pretty soon you graduate to fiction. After that, you can't kick the habit. And then there's oppression. Oppression? Sure. I mean, I like a story as much as the next Krell, but my ph pharmacologist can show the arbitrary cultural, sexual, and economic assumptions determining d determine every significant aspect of a story. Literature is a political tool used by ruling elites to ensure their hegemony. Anyone who denies that is a fish who can't see the water it swims in. With a fascist who tells you as he beats you that those blows you feel are your own delusion. Right. Look, can we settle this? I got things to do. This is of course the key to temporal this is of course the key to temporal translation. The past is another arbitrary construct. Language creates reality. Reality is smoke. Well, this time machine better not be smoke. We're going to find out the truth about the past, then we'll change it. By all means, find the truth. Flash turned to the last page of the contract, pricked his thumb, and marked a thumbprint on the signature line. After they sealed the agreement, Sepulveda walked the alien back to the courtyard. A crow flying pod with Vermeer's The Letter, varnished onto its door, sat at the focus of three spotlights. The painting was scorched almost into unrecognizability by atmospheric friction. The door peeled downward from the top, became a canvas surface, surfaced ramp. I saw some interesting lines inscribed on the coastal desert on the way here, Flash said. A bird, a tree, a big spider. In the sunset, it looked beautiful. Didn't think you humans were capable of such art. Is it for sale? I don't think so. That was done by some old Indians a long time ago really interested though I can look into it not necessary flash waggled his ears wiped his feet on Mark Rothko's earth and green and staggered into the pond 26 July 1533 <clears throat> Adawapa looked out of the window of the stone room in which he was kept across the plaza where the priest Valverde stood outside his chapel after his morning prayers Valverde's chapel had been the house of the virgins the women of the house had long since been raped by the Spanish soldiers, as the house had been by the Spanish god. Averti spoke with Estes. They were getting ready to kill him, Atahualpa knew. He had known ever since the ransom had been paid. He looked beyond the thatched roofs of the town to the crest of the mountains, where the sun was about to break in its tireless circuit. The cold morning air raised dew on the metal of the chains that bound him hand and foot. The metal was queer. Different from the bronze the Purex worked, or the gold and silver Attawapa was used to wearing. But gold was the sweat of the sun, and silver the tears of the moon. What was this metal? Dull and hard like the men who held him captive, yet strong, too. Stronger, he had come to realize, than the Inca. It, like the men who brought it, was beyond his experience. It gave evidence that Tawatsiu, the four quarters of the world, was not all the world after all. Atahualpa had thought none but savages lived beyond their lands. He'd imagined no man ready to face the ruthless necessity that himself. He'd ordered the death of whose car, his own brother. But he was learning that these men were capable of enormities against which the Inca Civil War would seem a minor discomfort. That evening, they took him out of the building to the plaza. In the plaza's center, soldiers had piled a great heap of wood on flagstones, some of which were still stained with the blood of his 6,000 slaughtered attendants. They bound him to a stake amid the heaped faggots. Valverde appealed one last time for the Inca to renounce Satan and be baptized. He promised that if Atahualpa would do so, he would earn God's mercy. They would strangle him rather than burn him to death. 
the rough wood pressed against his spine. Atahualpa looked at the priest, and the men gathered round, and the women weeping beyond the circle of soldiers. The moon, his mother, rode high above. Firelight flickered on the breastplates of the Spaniards, and from the waiting torches drifting, drifted the smell of pitch. The men shifted nervously. Creak of leather, clink of metal. Men on horses shod with silver. Sweat shouting on Valverde's forehead. Valverde stared at Atahualpa as if he desired something but was prepared to destroy him without getting it if need be. The priest thought he was showing Atahualpa resolve. Atahualpa saw that beneath Valverde's face he was a dead man. Pizarro stood aside, the Spanish, the Spanish viceroy of Steady and the scribe. Pizarro was an old man. He ought to be sitting quietly in some village outside the violence of life, giving advice and teaching the children. What kind of world did he come from to set men into old age, still charged with the lusts and bitterness of the young? Pizarro, too, looked as if he wanted this to end. Atahualpa knew that it would not end. This was only the beginning. These men would suffer for this moment as they had already suffered for it all their lives, seeking the pain blindly over oceans, jungles, deserts, probing it like a sore tooth until they found and grasped it in the plaza of Cajamarca, thinking they sought gold. They'd come all this way to create a moment that would reveal to them their own incurable disease. Now they had it. In a few minutes, they thought, would at last be over. But once he was gone, they would be free. The Atahualpa knew it would be with them ever after, and with their children and grandchildren and the million others of their race in times to come, whether they knew it this hour in the plaza or not, because they were sick, would pass the sickness on with their breath and semen. They could not burn out the sickness so easily as they could burn the Son of God to ash. This was a great tragedy, but it contained a huge jest. They were caught in a wheel of the sky and could not get out. They must destroy themselves. Have your way, priest, Atahualpa said. Then strangle me and bear my body to Cuzco to be laid with my ancestors. He knew they would not do it, and so would add an additional curse to their faithlessness. He had one final curse. He turned to Pizarro. You will have responsibility for my children. Pizarro looked at the pavement. He put up the torch and took Atahualpa from the pyre. The Verde poured water on his head and spoke words in the tongue of his god. Then they sat him upon a stool, bound him to another stake, set the loop of cord around his neck, slid the rod through the cord, and turned it. His women knelt at his side and wept. The Verde spoke more words. Atahualpa felt the cord, woven by the hand of some faithful Puric of Cajamarca, tighten. The cord was well made, it cut his access to the night air. Atahualpa's lungs fought, he felt his body spasm, and the plaza became cloudy, and he heard the voice of the moon. January 12, 2011. Israel Lamont was holding big time when a crowd monitor zipped over the alley. A minute later, one of the aliens lurched around the corner and approached him. Lamont was ready. I need to achieve an altered state of consciousness, the alien said, wore a red suit, lightning bolt on its chest. I'm your man, Lamont said. You just try this. Best stuff on the street. He held the vial out in the palm of his hand. Go ahead, try it. The crowd took it. How much? One million. The crowd gave him a couple hundred thousand. Down payment, it said. How does one administer this? What, you don't know? Thought you guys were hip. I have been working hard and I am unacquainted. That was ripe. You burn it, Lamont said. The crowd started toward the trash barrel fire. Before he could empty the vial into it, Lamont stopped him. Wait up! You use a pipe. Here, I'll show you. Lamont pulled a pipe from his pocket, torched up, and inhaled. The crow watched him. Brown eyes like a dog's. Goofy, honky face. The rush took him, and Lamont saw in the alien's face a peculiar need. The thing was hungry. Desperate. I may try? The alien reached out. Its hand trembled. Lamont handed over the pipe. Clumsily, the creature shook a block of crack into the bowl. Its beak-like upper lip, however, prevented it from getting its mouth tied against the stem. It fumbled with the pipe, or somewhere producing a book of matches. Shit, I'll light it, Lamont said. The crow waited while Lamont held his bick over the bowl. Nothing happened. Inhale, man! The creature inhaled. The blue flame played over the crack. Smoke boiled through the bowl. The creature drew in steadily for what seemed to be minutes. Serious capacity. The crack burned totally through. Finally, the crow exhaled. 
He looked at Lamont. His eyes were bright. Good shit, Lamont said. A remarkable stimulant effect. Right. Lamont looked over his shoulder toward the alley's entrance. It was getting dark, but he hesitated to ask for the rest of the money. Will you talk with me? Krell asked, swaying slightly. Surprised, Lamont said, Okay, come with me. Lamont led the Krell back to a deserted store that abutted the alley. They went inside, sat down on some crates against the wall. Something I've been wondering about you, Lamont said. You guys are coming to own the world. You fly across the planets, Mars and that shit. What you want with crack? We seek to broaden our minds, Lamont snorted. Huh, right. Might as well hit yourself in the head with a hammer. We seek escape, the alien said. I don't buy that neither. What you got to escape from? Krell looked at him. Nothing. They smoked another pipe. Krell leaned back against the wall, arms at, si at its side like a limp doll. Started a queer coughing sound, chest spasming. The mom thought it was choking and tried to slap it on the back. Don't do that, it said. I'm laughing. Laughing? What's so funny? I lied to Colonel Zip, it said. We want cocaine for kicks. Lamont relaxed a little. I hear you. We do everything for kicks. Makes for hard living. Better than maintaining consciousness continually without interruption. You said it. Human beings cannot stand too much reality, the girl said. We don't blame you. Human beings. Disgust. Horror. Shame. Nothing personal. You bet. Non-being penetrates that in which there is no space. Uh-huh. The alien laughed again. I lied to Sepulveda, too. Our time machines take people to the past they believe in. There is no other past. You can't change it. Who the fuck's Sepulveda? Let's do some more. They smoked one more. Good shit, it said. Just what I wanted. The crowd slid off the crate. Its head lolled. Here is the rest. Of your payment, it whispered and died. Lamont's heart raced. He looked at the Krell's hand lying open on the floor. In it was a full-size ear of corn fashioned of gold with tassels of, fair, of finely spun silver wire. Today. It's not just physical laws that science fiction readers want to escape. Just as commonly, they want to escape human nature. In pursuit of this, SF offers comforting alternatives to the real world. For instance, if you start reading an SF story about some abused wimp, you could be pretty sure that by Chapter 2, he's going to discover he has secret powers unavailable to those tormenting him. By the end of the book, he's going to save the universe. SF is full of this sort of thing, from the power fantasy of the alienated child to the alternate history where Hitler is strangled in his cradle and the Library of Alexandria is saved from the torch. Science fiction may, in this way, be considered as much an evasion of reality as any mind-distorting drug. I know that sounds a little harsh, but think about it. An alkaloid, like cocaine or morphine, invades the central nervous system. It reduces pain, produces euphoria, enhances our perceptions. Under its influence, we imagine we have supernormal abilities. Limits dissolve. Soon, hardly aware of what's happened to us, we're addicted. Science fiction has many of the same qualities. Typical reader comes to SF at a time of suffering. He seizes on it as a way to deal with his pain. It is bigger than his life. It's astounding, amazing, fantastic. Some grow out of it. Many don't. Anyone who's been around SF for a while can set examples of longtime readers as hooked and deluded as crack addicts. Like any drug addict, the SF reader finds a desperate justification for his habit. SF teaches him science. SF helps him avoid future shock. FF changes the world for the better. Right, so does cocaine. Having been an SF user myself, however, I have to say that living in a world of cruelty, immersed in a culture that grinds people into fish meal like some brutal machine, with histories of destruction stretched behind us back to the Pleistocene, I find it hard to sneer at the desire to escape, even if escape is delusion. October 18, 1527. Timu drove the foot plow into the ground, leaned back to break the crust, drew out the pointed pole, and backed up a step to let his wife, Collier, turn the earth with her hoe. To his left was his brother, Akia, to his right his cousin, Tupa, before them their wives planting the seed. Most of the Purex of Kajamarka were there, strung out in a line across the terrace. 
The men wheeled in the foot plows and the women or children carrying the sacks of seed potatoes. As he looked up past Collier's shoulder to the edge of the terrace, he saw a strange man approach from the post road. The man stumbled into the next terrace up from them, climbed down steps to their level. He was plainly excited. Collier was waiting for Timu to break the next row. She looked up at him questioningly. Who is that? Timu said, pointing past her at the man. She stood up straight and looked over her shoulder. The other men had noticed too and stopped their work. A Chosky coming from the next town, said Okia. A Chosky would go to the Kuroka, said Tupa. He's not dressed like a Chosky, Timu said. The man came up to them. Instead of a cape, loincloth, and flowing anka, the man wore uncouth clothing, cylinders of fabric that bound his legs tightly, a white short sleeve shirt that bore on its front the face of a man, flexible white sandals that covered all his foot to the ankle. He shivered in the spring cold. He was extraordinarily tall. His face, paler than a normal man's, was long, his nose too straight, mouth too small, lips too thin. Upon his face he wore a device of gold wire that hooking over his ears held discs of crystal before his eyes. The man's hands were large, his limbs long and spider-like, moved suddenly awkwardly. Gasping for air, the stranger spoke rapidly the most abominable Kichu Timu had ever heard. So down, Timu said, I don't understand. What year is this? the man asked. What do you mean? I mean, what is the year? It is the 34th year of the reign of the Sapa Inca, Juana Capac. The man spoke some foreign words. God damn, he said in a language foreign to Timu, which you and I would recognize as English. I made it. Timu went to the Caraca, and the Caraca told Timu to take the stranger in. The stranger told him that his name was Schwan. Timu's three-year-old daughter, Curry, reacting to the man's sudden gestures, unearthly thinness, and piping speech, laughed and called him the bird. So he was ever after to be known in that town. There he lived a long and happy life, earned trust and respect, brought great good fortune. He repaid them well for their kindness, alerting the people of the town to the coming of the invaders. When the first Spaniards landed on their shores a few years later, they were slaughtered to the last man. Everyone lived happily ever after.